Hi, Dave. Hi, Elsie. Uh, how are you? I am great. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. So this is the second sort of high for for us uh, because we met in the morning, right, uh, in our Toastmasters meeting. So uh, for my audience, this is Dave Baldwin. I have known Dave since 2016. And I will tell the audience how I know you. It's because in 2016, I joined my first Toastmasters club. And at that time, I think, Dave, you were what uh, we have these roles, uh, vice president. Of I was pro probably vice president of education at that point, or I might have been treasurer. I was I've worn a bunch of those hats. I, I yeah, before. either education or something to do with memberships. Because I remember I uh, you asked me who I want to be my mentor. And since I didn't know anyone, I said, I'd, I'd like you to be my mentor. So that's um, really my impression of you being my first mentor. But how would you say who or what Dave Baldwin is? Well, I have recently adopted the phrase process wizard. If I were to encapsulate everything I do, I, I, I create processes. And specifically, the kind of the reason and the motivation behind that is I want people to be able to accomplish what they want to accomplish. And, and my experience has been that people a lot of times don't do what they want to do in life because they think they can't learn something or they think, oh, I wasn't born with that talent. And I believe that if you have a desire to learn something, you can learn something. But a lot of times people don't have the right process. And so that's that's really I've, I've applied that in a lot of different areas. But everything I do comes back to processes. Right. And, and Dave, you just uh, gave that little presentation where you uh, come to me, at least across as a professional guy who is very into your thinking brain. But I also know that you are a human being and I have learned so much over the years about you. One thing I remember that how how you how I started to realize that you are more than just a process guy is I remember that you were talking about your weight loss and you becoming a vegan. Would you walk us a little bit through that journey? Sure. Yeah. Yeah well yeah and it's funny when I think about my weight loss journey. I mean, that, that's a classic example of where process can make all the difference, but, but rather than go into that, I'll just kind of share the story. So I was right now I, I've been at or close to my ideal weight, usually between 190 to 195 pounds for the last almost 15 years, but I was about 300 pounds at my heaviest. And that was around 2001. I had a lot of it was really just needing to overcome emotional eating. I was very isolated at, at the time. And I worked at a comfortable job that was 100% sedentary. I was working in a factory and I pretty much didn't do anything except worked, ate and slept. And whenever I was bored, I filled the gaps by eating. And if I sat down at the computer, I'd always go get food and have a snack at the computer. And I'd be sitting there eating the whole time I was at the computer. And I realized a lot of what I had to do in order to break the attachment to emotional needing was I needed to find something else to do. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that happened with when I, when I lost my job due to a layoff and a factory closure and a downsizing, mm -hmm. I went back to school and I, through good fortune, more than anything else, I fell into a more healthy social circle of people that were into fitness. And there was just a higher energy to, to my environment. And I just found that, A, I didn't have time to eat as much anymore, but I, my mind was engaged in something more meaningful. And I, I found that it, it just it didn't really require, I never went on a diet and didn't go on an exercise program. I didn't do anything like that, but that, that took off about 40 pounds or so. But every time there's been a shift, there was always a shift in my environment. And that's always been the key for me. Yeah. So, so you developed the process, like, have you ever fasted? Uh, I, and what I mean by that, uh, have you gone on for days without eating at all? I've never gone for days without eating, but I did experiment with fasting a little bit, maybe in 2009 and 2010, where I said one day a week, I'm not going to eat and I'm just going to drink water. I didn't really understand what I was doing very well. And I found that it was, I started feeling sick and my energy was depleted and I decided to discontinue that as a practice, but but now I've never really explored fasting from, from that standpoint. We, we are actually, I think, uh, quite opposites, which is not a bad thing. 
I have I have done fasting. I have done extensive fasting for for really for for a week, several times in my life. But I have not been able to consistently sit on a diet like like you just described. But anyway, I just uh, told you how I remember you. I remember this these little bits about you. Would you share with me how you remember me? What was the first impression? Sure. Yeah. I mean, and I can remember when you said 2016, I was actually, so I take your word for it that that's the right year. I would have guessed earlier if I thought, because it seems like it's been longer, but you're probably right. It was 2016. But I remember, I, I just remember getting when we originally talked in the initial conversations, you shared a lot about uh, the Latvian language in specific. And I remember you were working on some product ideas related to teaching Latvian. And I think you had done, like, if I remember correctly, you were, you taught the Latvian language or you taught ESL to, to Latvian speakers. I mean, there was a lot of our conversations were focused around the Latvian language. And then you talked a little bit about how there's different constructs and that there's yeah, we had talked on the general subject about how certain languages have concepts and structures that don't necessarily translate directly into another language. And I, I remember just finding you really to be an interesting person intellectually and, and you know, how you had shared a little bit about the different cultures. And I remember you telling me about the being at the really high northern latitudes and the, the differences in between really dark days in the winter and really bright days during the summer. And you kind of gave me just a, a glimpse into a whole different world that's that's very different than the world I grew up in. And I also remember us talking at one of those parking lot conversations where you had talked about there, there was a debate about that somebody had brought up that we were talking about the difference between an informative speech and an entertaining speech. And I remember you said, why do I, I don't need to be entertaining if I'm informative, being informative has value. And I remember the whole discussion being about, and this is something that stuck with me and something I agree with you on that point that our, our culture is so fixated on entertainment that people feel like you have to earn their attention all the time. And I know that that's been a shift that I've seen happening over a while, but I remember until that conversation made me really kind of stop and think, why is it people don't value being informed by itself like why does everything have to be a great story and be entertaining you know what 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 would it take to have a culture where people see value in knowledge information and wisdom without it having to be entertaining for so that was that was one of those conversations i remember as being particularly enriching in the sense that it, it, it caused me to stop and think about things that I, that I didn't automatically know to think about so yeah, I mean, obviously, there's been plenty over time. We didn't have TikTok back then, right? And we didn't yeah. have a lot of these other developments. And I know I kind of took a couple of years hiatus from Toastmasters since I had a job and we weren't in touch during that time. But I remember coming back in and just noticing that the, the change I saw was I saw more of a, an animated energy to you that, that I, that I didn't see before. And, and it felt like it's, I think we all kind of have our journeys of where we're figuring out little bits and pieces of our life purpose and our life mission. And I, I saw a level of animation and a level of maybe clarity, I guess, that's, that was more so than what, what used to be there when we originally met in the beginning. That's interesting what you remember, but because I still uh, maintain that opinion that an informative speech is still a valuable speech, right? Uh, I have added the touch of humor into my presentations, but I think that's more because that I am somebody who um, doesn't like to um, come across as a victim, even when I get victimized, and I think we most of us do. So I kind of try to laugh it off, and talk and joke about it, and um, dismiss actually problems. Whereas you have had a courage, really recently, to talk about very vulnerable things, especially when you came back. You talked about more openly than I not had noticed before about how you struggled with business and what were what your misconceptions were before, and then later even I, I hope I can mention I am. Sure. Uh, about uh, your men mental illness. So um, can you briefly share about 
some of that, for instance, yeah, your journey. Generally. Yeah, th there's a lot to unpack there. I, I will say I, one of the things that I really am uh, become more passionate about over time is being an advocate for the mentally ill. And I, I, only, I almost don't even like to use the mentally ill to describe a group of people because I believe it's a everybody suffers with mental illness to a degree. It's just a question of degrees. Mm -hmm. But when I think about how mental illness and mental health relates to business, there, there's definitely a lot of shifts in conversation that really need to happen. And the, the biggest thing that's the, 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 the thorn in my side that really offends me the most is this idea called fake it till you make it. And the idea that people should go out in the world and pretend to have their act together better than they do, pretend to know things they don't know. And it, it, I, I don't understand why we think it's a good idea to encourage children to be dishonest as a foundation for building a business relationship. It's a total lack of integrity and the dysfunction it's created in our culture. I, I don't understand how people don't see it. But when I bring this up to people, a lot of times people say, well, hey, I do it. It works for me. And I, I think it's just a really selfish and inconsiderate way to go about interacting in the world. But I, I think the, the, the hard part about mental illness and part of where I've been really trying to find what the solution really looks like is that, first of all, it's invisible. It's not, if I have a broken leg, everybody can see that I have a broken leg and people are going to interact with me in a particular way. Mental illness is an abstract concept, and, and not only can't people see it, but the, the other issue is people will, uh, will think they understand someone else's experience better than they do. And so I've recently, part of what I've started to wonder about is, is art possibly part of the answer? Instead of trying to describe one's experience directly, that's where storytelling comes in, that's where poetry, painting, music, and, and I, I often wonder does all art ultimately spring from a struggle with some form of mental illness that's, or, or some kind of a struggle that somebody just could not convey in a way that people could understand. And so that's, that's the inquiry I've been in recently. You know, so uh, I'm not sure if that answered your question very well. But yeah, well <laughs> and whatever the answer is, it's an answer. Yeah. I, I, I love the answer. I agree, not just mental illness, but for instance, I don't know if you've uh, heard those speeches where I've talked about my grandfather who was who was an artist uh, during uh, the Soviet times and the, the, the way of how he protested against that the regime of that time was through art. And then he was uh, sent to Siberia. He was one of those people who suffered for for uh, raising his voice through the art. So yes, art definitely has that functionality, and uh, probably that's why I do do art. Um, I don't know where to go from there. <laughs> from well it's, well, it's interesting because art also now you, you make me realize there's there's an element of symbolism in art. And then there becomes a political component to art in the sense that I, I might try to share a story that somebody else doesn't want shared. And it sounds like that was, I, I believe I remember hearing a talk about your grandfather, but I, I'm, I'm not remembering the details at the moment right now. But, I, but yeah, I, I think there's part of what we have to come up against is there's the opposition of one will against another. And it's not necessarily about what's happening in Washington, D.C. or the White House, but it's but it's at it's in the sitting across the table, the person across from me, I always have to be kind of aware, is there an opposition of wills and how, how can I interact with that in the best way? Uh, because I think it's, you know, sometimes it's a matter of just being aware of what's really going on because things just aren't what they seem. No, they are not definitely. And why I, I had been uh, thinking about asking you for this conversation, but um, this uh, I asked you today because of your speech this morning and how much it resonated with me and other speeches prior to this speech, but this was like a culmination of it all, but not because I have the same experience you have, but I have a feeling I have an experience or experiences from the opposite side, so to say how it is to live with people who have mental illness and uh, trying to be compassionate and understand and then um, not take care of myself.
And that was what your speech today was about. So there's always that conflict. Who do you take care of? Well, and and I think there's there's a, a new word that we don't have that we we need. To, and I think I've seen if, uh, people use the word selfish incorrectly a lot of the times because they'll say, "Oh, you should be more selfish." And and I think, well, no. What they're really trying to say is you need to be self focused, self aware. You need to advocate for yourself. I think the problem with the word selfish is it inherently means being inconsiderate toward others, which I think really what we're trying to get at is you need to be, you've got to take responsibility for yourself, be aware of how your behavior might impact someone else. But I, I think what we run into in, in our society is we have really elevated being selfless as, as this virtue and, and the idea to say like I, I should just take care of everybody else and not care about myself like that's there's all the messages out in the world pointing in that direction and I've I've for a while now held the philosophy that if something truly serves me it's not going to harm somebody else mm -hmm. it's not going to cause harm to somebody else the, the the tricky part is when I see someone else engaged in destructive behavior, I have to, it, there, there becomes a point when I have a, an ethical duty to interrupt the behavior. And sometimes that may cause lesser harm to somebody else, but, but just in the sense that there's no way to avoid causing some kind of harm, but for the sake of mitigating a greater harm, I guess. So there's, uh, I mean, and there's, unfortunately, there's no formula for this, but yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm totally there with you. So, uh, with this we are on the same side so dave uh this comes across very clearly in your communication because i've i've i'm following you on tiktok tell me about why you're communicating this do you have offers for people yeah Right now, I, I've actually just put together a with uh, my co-author, Sheila Brown and I. Well, actually, I'm her co-author, frankly. So Sheila and I have partnered on a book called the, the, the Life Quest Playbook, which is it's just a workbook. And it's where we're in the process of getting it approved on Amazon should hopefully be live in just a few days. That's that's one offer. But I'm, I'm right now I'm self-employed and I've, I've been doing a combination of accounting work and some degree of consulting. But I'm quite frankly, just in one of those seasons of life where I'm reinventing myself. I am working on a couple of different books and projects and, and, and things. And I've got my TikTok channel where you can find Dave, the process wizard, but it's, it's a season of planting seeds. And there's also some, some pruning back of, of certain things. And it, it's really the, the question of who is Dave Baldwin really is yeah. a question I've been exploring for the last three to six months and in more depth than I have really before. But that's uh, so. So I don't necessarily have a whole lot in the way of offers for someone to to, to participate in immediately, but I, I expect I will as I get a little further down this process. Yeah, absolutely. And I loved how you actually switched to who is Dave Baldwin because who is Dave Baldwin and what is Dave Baldwin dreaming about? That's a great question. So the so the answer, the first answer that comes to my mind from years of, of thinking about that question is the future of community. When I think about innovation, we usually if I say the word innovation or invention, people think about gadgets and stuff and technology and airplanes and, and all that kind of thing. I'm actually thinking when I think about innovation, I think, what would it look like to innovate better relationships, like stronger communities where people have really fluid communication, really high levels of trust beyond anything we even have a conception of now. And that that's what I dream of. And there's many cocktail napkin sketches I have of, of what that could be. But it's as you can probably appreciate, a lot of it also exists in the abstract without a lot of concrete examples to compare to. But that's that's what it, what I'm ultimately I want I ultimately dream of being the Johnny Appleseed of communities and instead of planting trees I want to go and plant trust seeds in, in a community and, and just move from one community to the next and and really challenge the world to explore what would be possible if we learn to to develop a, a level of trust and loyalty that's that's unknown to the human race up to this point that's so beautiful Dave can I ask you a favor or I don't know if it's a favor. Would you mind reading your poem? 
I'm happy to do that. I would just need to find it on my computer very quickly here. <laughs> the poem's title is One More Paper Cut. I've never faced a tiger or a battlefield. I've never gone hungry. A thousand trials I've never endured. But my heart carries the tiny scars of a thousand paper cuts. I was born with a healthy body and a roof over my head. I don't know why, on many days, my heart does not smile. The world is my oyster, and sadness my constant companion. Many have told me to cheer up, man up, or put on my big boy pants. I should be happier, or so I've been told. So I sigh and carry on. With each passing year, I learn to conceal the sorrow in my heart and show a smile on my face. I smile or I look away when friends and family ask, how are you? I say, just fine, thanks, regardless of the truth, if only to protect my heart from one more paper cut. But every now and then, I find a kind friend or passing stranger with whom no words are needed. We see each other's paper cuts and a simple glance says, I know. I've never faced a tiger or a battlefield. I've never gone hungry. A thousand trials I've never endured. But my heart carries the tiny scars of a thousand paper cuts. It's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. I noticed just as I read at that time that I had the urge as I read the last line to jump in and artificially inject humor to, to dissipate the emotion around it and, and, and make some light hearted.